Is, uh, Rob Goodwin, chair of the DRB. I'd like to call this uh, February 7th uh, regular DRB meeting to order. Uh, I'm going to introduce the members of the board uh, starting at my left here. I got Kevin O'Connell. And on the uh, Zoom platform, we have um, Michael Lazorczyk. Good evening. Uh, Joe Kiernan. Hello. Abby White. Hi. Kathy Burgess. Hello. Catherine. And Dean Leon. Hello. How are you guys? Perfect. Okay. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, I guess it will be Meredith. We didn't flush this out to review the. Um, remote meeting procedures uh, we have a little swap going on due to the nature of the applications uh, and uh, I'll let Meredith go right ahead all right give me just a minute I am going to be sharing my screen um, and this is more for people who might be watching via orca um, but it's going to be some information for other people who haven't done a remote meeting with the DRB previously. Uh, oh, hold on one sec. Sorry, I don't usually have. I'm used to doing it all from in there. All righty, can everybody see a PowerPoint? Yes, yes, sure. Okay, great. So, uh, for those of you viewing this meeting via Orca Media, you can participate in the DRB meeting using the Zoom platform. You can either click on, paste this link into your web browser and, or I guess if you're watching it on your television, write it down and then type it into your web browser. Um, and that will take you right into the Zoom meeting. You'll be able to see the screens we look at. You'll be able to ask questions, um, give testimony. Um, you can also dial in using this phone number and this meeting ID. Um, if anyone has any problems accessing the meeting, please email me at this email address. Alternatively, we do have Michael Miller on tonight who will also be staffing, um, and so you can email him as well. Um, either one of us will work. For those attending via Zoom, turning on your video is optional. Um, and for everyone attending, please keep your microphone on mute when you're not speaking. This will reduce background noise. We don't seem to have anybody on primarily via phone. Um, so I'm not gonna go through the phone procedures. Um, if you have any issues, there's an echo. Uh, if you're having any issues getting into the meeting, any technical difficulties, um, with sound, please use the chat function um, and please use that only for those logistics or troubleshooting issues. Any comments or questions about the substance of an item, please raise your hand either physically or using the raise hand button on your toolbar um, and the chair will call on you or um, Mike or I will let the chair know that there's somebody wanting to talk. Um, once the chair has recognized someone to speak, um, please make sure to provide your full name and address for the record. In the event that Mike or I get notice that someone is trying to get into the meeting and we aren't able to get them into the meeting, um, the meeting will have to be continued to a time and place certain. I'm going to now hand this all back over to the chair. Thank you, Meredith, uh, for uh, your summary. It's uh, always good to get that stuff straightened out. Um, at this time, I will accept a motion to approve this evening's agenda. So moved. Second the motion. Motion by Kevin, second by Jean. Uh, how do the members vote? Kevin? Yes. Michael? 
Yes. Joe? Yes. Abby? Yes. Catherine? Yes. Gene? Yes. And Rob, myself votes yes. That's the agenda is unanimously approved. Uh, ready. Thank you everyone for uh, coming out this evening to tonight's meeting. We have two applications uh, this evening. Um, this meeting will be a little bit different uh, than ones before. As you'll see, we have our uh, planning uh, department head, uh, Mike Miller, sitting in the chair that Meredith uh, is usually sitting in. Uh, this first application, uh, due to the nature of it, it's an appeal that Meredith was involved in, so Mick is uh, acting as staff um, for this. And uh, Meredith is here to provide what information she may need to for the first application. Um, and then for the second application uh, uh, on the agenda on uh, Granite Shed Lane, uh, Meredith, I believe, will be joining us uh, up here uh, and taking over to support us in the, the re remainder of the meeting. Um, any board members have any other general comments before we uh, get started in tonight's meeting? Okay. Um, the next item is approval of the meeting minutes for uh, the December 20th. 2021 uh, meeting and um, we can do that because we have enough members present. Does anyone have any uh, amendments um, or changes or a motion to approve? I'll make the motion to approve the uh, minutes of December 20th, 2021 as written. I'll second. I have a motion by Kevin, a second by Catherine. Um, Kevin, how do you vote? I vote yes. And uh, Michael? Yes. Joe? Yes. Bobby? Yes. Catherine? Yes. Jean? Was not present. Thank you, Jean. Uh, and Rob, myself, votes yes. That is approved unanimously. Um, at this time, we will now um, move on to approval of the minutes for the January 18th, 2022 meeting. Um, and um, I will accept a motion or amendments uh, as board members wish to proceed. Motion to approve. Motion by Jean. Second. I think that was a second by Catherine. Right. Um, All righty. So, Kevin, how do you vote? Uh, I was not present at that meeting. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Michael? Yes. Um, Joe was not there. Um, Abby? Yes. And uh, Jean? Yes. And Rob, myself, votes yes. That is unanimously approved. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, are you uh, Susan? Yes. So you can uh, step right up here if you feel comfortable. I'm assuming you would like to speak tonight on this application. <laughs> well, I thought we were going to do it a little differently, but okay. Okay. <laughs> Um, Do you want me to? If you can, uh, well, I guess I will introduce uh, this item of the agenda. Um, we're moving on to the 25 Cliff Street application. Recording in progress. Which is uh, an appeal um, of an uh, administrative decision of the, the zoning administrator. And um, so you can introduce yourself, and, and uh, we're going to have uh, Mike Miller give a little overview um, of the sort of technical process that we're in here uh, for everybody, okay. and uh, and then you know you can sort of go through your you know your concerns and say whatever you like to give us information we need to come to a decision here. Um, you, you want me to do that after Michael? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you just want me to introduce myself? Yeah. Okay. My name is Susan Manfield Abdo. And I live at 32 Cliff Street. Can you? Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. And um, I have property adjoining 
25 Cliff Street. That's right next to 25 Cliff Street. And I am the property right below yeah. part of the property on 25 Cliff Street. Yeah. I, I believe that the appellant should be sworn in. Yes. Yes. Oh. Um, and uh, is there anybody else on the Zoom platform other than Arthur who wishes to speak on this application this evening? Okay, so Arthur and uh, um, Susan are the two only two members of the, the public that will be uh, you know providing testimony on this application this evening. Um, and so we will swear both of you in, um, you know, together. Um, and so I will do that. Do you want right me to raise now. my hand? Uh, yes. Okay. Absolutely. So all those interested in providing testimony in this application, would you please raise your right hand to be sworn in as a witness? Do you? Um, I'm, I'm sorry, Rob. I've got to interrupt because I haven't done this before with an appeal. Mike, technically, aren't I a witness who should be sworn in as well? For this one, might as well we might safe. as well just yeah, I yeah. Would just do that just to be safe. Thank you, Meredith. All right, so all those interested in providing testimony on this application, would you please raise your right hand to be sworn in as a witness? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. I do. Right, thank you. So we have Meredith, Arthur, and Susan all in as witnesses. Um, so I will now turn it over to uh, Mike for a brief overview of where we're at and how we got here. All right, so brief brief overview. Uh, so uh, one quick uh, point for everybody to, who's trying to figure out why I'm here and Meredith is not. This is the only time uh, is when we have an appeal uh, and it's not required under state law to do it this way, but we find it's in the best interest of uh, kind of the public and keeping things uh, above board and fair that when somebody appeals a zoning administrator decision that the planning director may will uh, then be the staff for that appeal. So the it will get a whole new review with a whole new set of eyes. So. Meredith is the zoning administrator and she made the decision in this case and it has been appealed, which is why I'm going to be acting as staff and Meredith is acting as, um, as defendant, if you, if you want, uh, defending her decisions. So uh, this application uh, was from Arthur Folsh of 25 Cliff Street to create a temporary access to uh, the rear of his property for the installation of a solar array and he applied for that on October 27th. Um, uh, and um, so beginning uh, October 28th, the planning department started to receive some concerns and complaint from uh, Ms. Banfield. Oh, and let me first apologize, Susan. Throughout my staff report, I had her her name is Banfield with an N and a Banfield with a D. So I've omitted the D and I now understand it's your last name is reversed. It should be Banfield Abdo and not Abdo Banfield. It doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Okay. I just want to make sure we're proper in how we address you. Um, so um, Ms. Banfield is the neighbor across the street and is a, a owner of the a part owner of the property next adjacent to this. Uh, and the planning staff re um, reviewed the concerns at the time uh, and the comments and found none of them would materially impact whether the permit should be issued. And therefore the permit was issued on October 29th and that permit had a 15 day appeal window. So appeals would need to be filed by November 14th. On Saturday, November 13th, um, Ms. Banfield filed a timely appeal of the zoning permit by placing it in the drop box in City Hall. On Monday, November 15th, unaware that the appeal had been filed, Mr. Folsh started his construction and um, Ms. Banfield notified Mr. Folsh and the city of the fact that there was an appeal and we went to the drop box and found said appeal. 
notified Mr. Folsh to cease construction, which he did except to stabilize the disturbed area that he had already started construction on and to install silt fencing. Uh, on Tuesday, November 16th, Public Works Manager Zach Blodgett inspected the stabilization and confirmed the site had been stabilized for winter. Um, uh, the subject parcel is in residential 9000 and uh, the development review board first was supposed to hear this on December 20th and it has been moved to tonight after two two movings. So So uh, so Susan, do you want to, you know, give a little bit of overview of you and uh present however you would like to proceed. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, I think I'd like to begin by saying that I think it's been at least six years since Arthur Fulch has spoken to me. I have no idea why. But anyway, that's from the get go. That just shows you the strain on our relationship. And um, Arthur sent me an email and in his email, he said he planned to use the right of way to access. He didn't say, I think it was, he said, I think he said in the track, uh, a track machine to access the back of his property for a solar array. He said that, and I just can't believe he didn't know that that is not allowed under the contract that he signed when he moved into the property. There are to be no vehicles with motors going up a path. And um, several emails went back and forth between us because I understand I'm very pro solar and several emails went back. And then it became, I became very aware that if I allow this track vehicle to go up a path that I am setting a precedent. And so I just said no. And that's when, am I not doing something right? And that, that's when I got wind of a temporary access. And 13 year old granddaughter, bless her heart. She found the pictures in my cell phone, but my cell phone wasn't set up. So that's why you got the pictures very late. But this is a very steep bank. And um, I sent you, um, I have the pictures here. If you need to see them date, they're, they're time, they're stamped and they're dated. Um, to show the steepness of the bank. Um, these these were forwarded to DRB. Okay, this afternoon. So you have these are different pictures than the pictures that I sent from my iPhone because uh -huh. Capital Copy Copy took these pictures of the date and timestamp right off. And I I just want to point out that this yellow machine is a city machine. And it's parked right in front of the steep bank. And, um, and then as the pictures go on and their date and their, their time, their stamp, it shows on November 15th at 7.50 in the morning, I went out to take a picture of the straw or hay bale. I was standing on public property. <clears throat> and that's when I took these pictures came up with Arthur coming out of his house and coming up very close to me and asking me, why am I taking pictures? And I said, because it's city's right away. And at that time, I told him that I have filed an appeal on your project. I said it very clearly. As I walked into my house, Arthur called me a swear word. So I know he heard me because he got more upset. And then I took pictures of the Green Mountain Solar track machine. And I went out a second time 
when that track machine came over close to the to the bank and I said to the Green Mountain Solar person, I said, if any, well, first I should back up. I called the office of zoning and planning and I left a message with that office, but I got no call back. And um, then at 8.13, I went and I talked to the Green Mountain Solar hired person and I said, if any part of this machine touches the ground, I will call the Montpelier police. And these pictures are so important because they show the Green Mountain Solar person getting off the machine. They show him walking back to Arthur's house. And the last one shows Arthur and the Green Mountain Solar person at 814 walking up his driveway. So there were two times that a neighbor, and I don't care if you just absolutely hate my guts, but what a neighbor says to you, I have filed an appeal, then you have a respectful duty to listen to that person. And I said it twice. Wrong. And then I heard, I went back mm -hmm. into the house and I heard machine noise. And I looked out my window, which is right across the street, and I saw the machine trying to grab onto the bank. And so I called the Montpelier police and I went out and stood in front of the track machine. And um, I really was beside myself. I didn't know what to do. So that is the beginning of this yes. unfortunate situation. So, so, you, so you kind of you know, laid out a number of uh, sort of very clear concerns in your you know appeal here. And uh, so, one of our challenges here as the board is you know we have to sort of take we take the zoning regulations and like your appeal and we compare them and we see if there's anything we can do to you know satisfy your concerns and resolve the situation and um so I can, I can tell you this yeah the erosion structure that was set up yeah. did not last two days it was down and i sent emails to michael miller indicating that and then it was put up and then it was down two days it's been down since january 18th mm -hmm. It has done absolutely nothing as far as erosion goes through the winter. Zilch. And when Green Mountain Solar put, apparently put back the bank, all I saw, I watched, I watched them as they put back the bank. And all I watched them do was put all the big roots that they tried to take out, lay them on, put them on the bank, throw some on top, throw some grass seed, and that was it. Oh, throw some hay, some straw or hay, and that was it. And I told Michael Miller, I sent an email, I said, it is not, the bank is not put back so that it will not erode through the winter. And so it's eroding. That's for sure, but I don't. I'm not, I won't go out and take more pictures. I have, I could, uh, yeah, I have, go ahead. I have a question for Mike. Mike, uh, where are we in terms of the status of the application and the approval that was granted by Meredith? I mean, what's the issue? I mean, is the issue is it a, is it the physical? issue in terms of access across land which is which is governed by uh, a right of way which is is i mean i if, if, if no, a right -of -way, yeah no so the, the confused, original totally there, his original project his original proposal was to try to take a, a less steep route and go through the uh the, the common the land that susan owns beside them where there's a right of way 
so uh, this, when he so, was denied that access to use that right of way which it would have been done by the landowner that would have been that would it wouldn't have been his land it would have been it's, it's just about five or six property owners that own the neighboring property susan being one of them okay. it would be using their property to make access to his back land when that was denied his proposal that is permitted is entirely on his own property and it is to go up basically a, a, a steep slope yeah. um, you can see from her pictures and right arthur recognizes and has acknowledged that it's a steep slope um dpw and the planning because staff have all it, said it's above 30 percent it's greater than 30 percent so it is clearly a so, steep that, slope. so that's what the that's what the uh allowances for is to allow uh, disturbing a 30 plus degree slope it's not a right away issue nope it's it's entirely a slope issue it's entirely a, a slope and erosion issue and he was looking for mr Fulch was looking for a, a temporary access so this is uh, a limited time and we can get into some of the if we get to conditions and discussions if we reach that point later okay, on so but it's really it's about a temporary access to to get up the steep slope with this track equipment so they can install the solar and then drive back down reseed and restabilize the bank and put up the the erosion control and so that's arthur's in, in a nutshell that's arthur's application okay. that was approved okay thank go ahead you. susan it's your, it's your time um i own the right of way mm -hmm. there are five families now mm -hmm that have access to the right of way. And Arthur knew when he bought his property about 10 years ago, he knew there would be no access by a vehicle on the right of way because he has the list. And that was not drawn up by me, it was drawn up by another attorney in our neighborhood who has since passed away. So he knew that. That's what really, frankly, irritates me. So because he did not get the access through the right of way, he went to this temporary access. And I have a letter here dated 1996, 97, where I did some improvements on my property. And I had a water problem from the right of way because of the improvements. There is a mountain behind with, and there's lots of ledge. And so I talked to the neighbors because we, you know, I improved the right of way so they would have a good path going up. And I ended up with water. So we had to grade the right of way. So the water goes towards the, it's a six inch divot, about a six inch divot. I'm not gonna argue that. It's a little divot that runs along the north part of the turnaround. And so the right of way is over here and we had to grade it and I had to put plantings in. And I also had, I put seed in, in so that it would slow the water down. Okay, then I had the city come up and I, 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 first I went down and I asked him, I said, could you just make that divot a little bit bigger? You know, because I'm having a water problem with the right of way, with the water coming down. And they said, you know, we cannot make the divot any bigger because it, there's ledge. There is ledge all the way through this area. I mean, you can see a great big ledge rock just to the right part the right side of where Arthur wants to do his temporary access. So I just had to accept the fact that I keep the divot open so the water will go towards the divot, okay? And then there is a grate, an underground grate, and there's actually two. There's one up to the, when you're looking at my, standing in front of my house and facing Arthur's house, there's one to the right of his driveway, and then there's one there's one to the right of his driveway, and then there's also one to the left of his driveway. Mm -hmm. When this is a number of years ago, Arthur did improvements to his property, and there is a pipe coming out mm -hmm. in front of right in front on the 
towards the grate on the, when you're looking at this property on the right side, water comes out of that pipe that Arthur put in all the time. I asked Meredith, where is that water coming from? And she did not know. Now, maybe you can get Arthur to say, because he put the pipe in. But when I was having improvements done to my property, the bulldozer just on the surface nicked an old lead pipe and water came gushing out. Mm -hmm. And the contractor said, I don't, that water is coming from across the street. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why they didn't cap it off. Mm -hmm. So the professionals put a crimp, what they call a crimp in the pipe. And it's, it's not, it's right on the surface. It's not very deep, mm -hmm. but it's under the crawl space of my house. And the way they acted, it was coming from that property. Okay. 25 Cliff Street. So I am very concerned about water. Okay. I'm very concerned about water and I'm very concerned about erosion. Okay. And I'm very concerned about ledge. You know, we couldn't even make the divot any big, bigger because, because of the ledge. And there is ledge throughout. Yeah. So well, I think... know that I could go after Arthur if he does, if he does this temporary access and makes a problem for me. Yeah. But I really don't want to do that. <laughs> Well, so so I think that uh, we have uh, you know sort of a lot of information here, and uh, would would it be okay if, if now we gave Arthur maybe five minutes to sort of like uh, talk about his projects and whatnot, and um, we can uh, go I from there I've, with I've, questions. I, I think I've. I just want to say one other thing. Okay. I've already dealt with some problems with water, yeah. in terms of my house from Irene. Uh huh. We are expected to get twenty five percent more downpours that's what the, i read in the paper so the water problem is not going to go away mm -hmm. frankly you know it's just not so okay okay absolutely well rob I, I would just comment before we get too far into this uh, you know i'm i'm questioning whether the resolution to this issue which is by you know it's bifurcated it's it's both a technical issue and and a legal issue. It's also a neighbor neighbors at war issue. And um, I think we need to be extremely focused as to what it is we're dealing with as a board and what it is we can do in terms of the application and any resolution to the uh, uh, to the neighbor situation. Yeah, and I think that the, you know the, the next step going forward. I, you know, we obviously usually hear from the applicant. But there's not necessarily an applicant here. There's an appellant. There's an appellant, so but not an applicant. Sort of like an overview right. of the project yeah. and you know what they're planning to do to you know address erosion and address any you know that type of stuff. I just um, want to I want to add one yeah. thing. These stumps that you see, there's two sets of stumps in the picture. Yeah. The city graciously took down some ash trees that were really threatening my house. That's how close my house is just, it's about 10 feet from the, from the pavement. Right. And so Alex, who is the tree arborist said he would plant some lilacs or something on the bank when mm -hmm. he, when he took them down. That was just a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And so there's been nothing really planted on there, mm -hmm. but the bank has been holding. Oh, okay. Okay. So, um, Arthur, do, do you wish to provide a little review of your project for the board uh, so we can just sort of weigh all the information here? Sure. Just, just to start with a couple of clarifications. So, first of all, I am one of the landowners who abuts my own property. So, I am also in it. And clearly, this is a contentious issue. Susan's description does not fit mine in terms of how that property works or is agreed to. But that's not for this hearing to decide. It does happen to be context as to why 
Nicole, my partner, and I decided that we would try to put in a temporary access because we have a, a solar project which we've been working on for some time. And we are at a point where we are able, we have a permit now from the state and we want to put the panels up. We need to get a machine in that can drill screws into the ground. To do that, they need the track machine to get up. So it's not ideal for us either. We, we recognize this is a steep bank. This is not our preferred route, but this is where we are. So we're trying to figure out how to do it in the best way possible. Uh, so obviously we've, we approached the city because we knew it's in the city's interest to uh, safeguard both the right of way and the steep slope. And we believe that we came up with a, a proposal that satisfies us getting a track machine, both an excavator and a skid skier up that bank, put the screws in for the array and get those machines out and, you know, tend to the bank so that it will be stable and it will grow. We have, you know, we talked about plantings and so on and so forth. And, you know, I don't really want to hash out the details of the, why our neighborhood is so acrimonious, but I think it's worth noting that when Susan finished her last statement about the stumps that were left on the bank, that's my property. She directed the city to cut trees on my property and then proceeded to burn those trees for firewood. So, you know, the, the sense of entitlement and ownership of Nicole and my land by Susan in this case is very difficult for us. We, we don't want to have conflict around this. We'd really like to just get the solar panels up, but we're being put into a position where we don't have real, we're making a suboptimal choice. We believe we're making one that's that's reasoned. And we believe we're making one that will work and will protect all the stakeholders who are involved. But at the end of the day, it's not how we'd like to do it. Um, I'm happy to clarify any of the other points around this, but I think you know the the permit is I hope fairly straightforward. We want to build you know a very narrow uh, path going up a steep bank that's going sort of perpendicular to the bank itself that curves into our backyard you know we're at the end of cliff street we're on there's a you know there's steep banks all around us but this once we're over that initial bank which is about 12 feet plus or minus depending on where you stand in the cul-de-sac to see it after that it's a reasonable path into our backyard so Again, it's not the best approach, but it does seem viable, and that's what we're doing at this point. So that's, that's our that's the plan to be able to make the solar panel project work. Thanks. To clarify real quick, when you say temporary access, what's the timing and duration of that um, proposal? So Green Mountain Solar and and their subcontractor, which is Flint Hill Contracting, uh, they told us they need about forty eight hours to actually do that work. So the intention really was is we need to drive the machine up, put the screws in and drive it back and repair it. And that looks like something on the order of two days. But I think we all know in our experience of various construction projects, two days never is two days. It probably ends up being more than that, but that's, they don't believe, you know, they're not seeing, you know, traffic going up and down. They're just seeing like the time it takes to create it, the time it takes to install and then to get out. And again, they are saying that's like 48 hours. And is this work that can be done in the winter or they need to wait till spring to do this? This is not work we would entertain in winter. I mean, even even though, you know, like that bank seems to have be fairly dry, we would want to give it time for all the water to melt out from it. So we want to make sure that it is, you know, that it is reasonable that we're not going to cause undue, you know, problems for ourselves trying to go through mud and whatnot. Yes, Susan, I, I would real quick. just like to say something. I have a deed to my property. And when Arthur confronts that issue, he is barking up a, you know, a tree that he does not yeah. have a deed and, and i don't it's, no, sorry Susan, i don't want to cut you off here but unfortunately this board we can't you know, i know but i'm with, just saying that yeah. you know and i am not in the position i never will be mm -hmm. and he needs to understand yes. this i will never give my property away i pay taxes on that property yes. and i will never give it away and he can be as contentious as he wants but he's never going to make me move and the pr people that take over my house will not move either okay that being said 
something that is new that is appropriate for me to say to this board is that I have been in touch with the public utilities department and the public utilities commission and they are not happy they are not happy because i wasn't informed about this project and it was approved last august and there is no way i could make my issues clear because i was not informed and so this hearing may be all for naught if Arthur's solar array, which unfortunately the kind he wants is revoked. And those are the words they used. And one person asked me, well, why doesn't he just put a solar array on top of his house? And I said, I don't know. And so I'm bringing that up because there are other options besides tearing down a bank. And I've been told by Meredith Crandall that the bank will never be the same. And here we have a little divot that's directing the water. And you know, it's just, um, it's just something I think that we can look into. So, so let me ask you, if you, if you had a, not to say that the board would require this because we have some procedural stuff you know to, to talk about you know here um you know we have a process where if you're disturbing steep slopes uh, you have to have a plan prepared by a professional engineer to make sure that the drainage is you know is okay if if you were to go through that process which would that satisfy the majority of your concerns well i think it would go a long way okay. if the person could say where the water's coming from okay that came gushing out of, you know, the pipe that's underneath my house. Mm -hmm. I, all they could tell me is that it's across the street. And so I have the, I have the knowledge that there are several springs across the street mm -hmm. and all of them bring water down. Mm -hmm. My house was built in 1880 yeah. and it's still standing. <laughs> You know, amazingly, it's been built into the cliff and it's still standing. It's the only house that's, you know, it's all by itself. Yeah. Um, so you would like some answers on to where the water is going exactly? Boy, I tell you, I would love some answers. Okay. I, I didn't I didn't pursue it when that pipe was nicked yeah. because there wasn't really any reason for me to pursue it. I've lived in that that house for 35 years. This issue has never come up and I would never expect it to come up because the reason I wanted to have a site visit is that frankly, anybody looking at the site, I would think that they could say, oh my goodness, this is gonna cause big time erosion. And the other thing is Based on these pictures, I cannot trust this neighbor. I do not, frankly, he scares me. And so I don't know if what he's gonna do, if he's allowed a temporary access, if that's gonna set a precedent for future access. And then I'm the one that's gonna have to deal with it. So. Okay, so I kinda wanna, just move over to um, change gears a little bit here um, to start kind of digging through the regs and some of these issues. Um, this the staff report sort of first big issue that we point to is uh, you know this question about steep slopes and whether you know the provisions uh, you know were applied correctly uh, you know thus far on this application. Um, you know it, on page uh, four of the staff report here, and I think was previously said you know it, it doesn't to be any disagreement here about how the you know the slopes maps for the city which the you know city's you know, zoning regulations you know direct you to use um that this area in question uh you know is um an area with uh 30 percent slopes um or uh greater um but um 
Mike, do you want to maybe expand a little bit upon the you know where we are as far as steep slopes and what the decision was made on the administrative level related to steep slopes? Okay, so what what happened during the um, zoning permit process was that uh, Meredith had the application. She noted, as Arthur noted, that it was a steep slope. Um, she reviewed uh, this with Zach Blodgett, who is a licensed engineer, um, works for Public Works, and uh, talked to him about the this proposal being, you know, this narrow going up the steep slope with the tracked equipment. And he felt that this was going to be um, that this was going to be okay, uh, provided it was uh, had the proper erosion control because it was going to be temporary because it was going to be of limited scope. They're just gonna be roughing out a path um, that was going to be fine. So under the under the regulations, um, Meredith has a right to waive certain application requirements. And so there is an application requirement that says you need an engineer's report if you're going to disturb 30% slopes. Meredith made a determination that based on her conversations with Zach Blodgett, that this is going to be temporary, it's going to be of limited scope, that a full engineering report would not be needed. Um, the second piece, you know, we're kind of splitting hairs a little bit on these things here, there is also a requirement to have a hearing. And that's where I noted in the staff report that I think it, uh, although um, Zach has agreed that this doesn't need a hearing, uh, that this doesn't need an engineer's report, um, it probably, in my opinion, should have had a hearing because it was going to disturb 30% slopes. We don't have a hearing requirement tonight. We are having a hearing, so therefore, it is certainly the option of the DRB to go through and say, um, this is the hearing, this is the opportunity to comment and make a decision as a board. Um, so that that's a little bit of the, the salty. You could, as a board, say you want to have a separate engineering report produced. Um, basically making a different decision than Meredith. You also could say we want to have a, that, uh, a new Warren public hearing um, with that new engineering report. So the board has some options with respect to this. Um, and it's up to you, I guess, what path you'd want to take. Do you want to just make this a hearing? Um, if you want a separate engineer's report, that's, that's up to you at this point. Well, I guess I have, a, I have one more question. So you have the threshold for the 30%. Yes. Is there a square footage um, as it relates to, you know, the amount of area disturbed that falls into this or not? In our no, the regulations, unfortunately, just say any disturbance of soil over 30%. And Meredith, you know, because a little bit of this application and some others, we, we thought, you know, maybe we'll talk to the Planning Commission and some others about whether there should be a low threshold that would say, you know, the minimal disturbance. But as the regs are written, any disturbance of soil over 30%, automatically triggers a hearing. Um, and therefore, even though this is only going to disturb two or 300 square feet, I believe, was the amount of soil that would be disturbed, it's above zero and therefore technically required a hearing. So obviously, um, interesting. Just to, to put it into context here, obviously you have to draw the line somewhere because you know you could go out with your garden shovel and you could you know dig a wheelbarrow out of the side of the hill and you're just disturbing, disturbing a thirty percent slope. But like you know, and I know that that's not you know the the hair you're trying to pick here. But you know, obviously there's at some point there's a judgment call to say uh, that uh, you know there's some some disturbance of steep slopes that happens in this city um, where you know you don't need an engineered plan and you, you know you, you don't need a hearing um, and so. I just, just yeah, and a little bit of the nature of, of the disturbances, there wasn't any soil being moved, there wasn't being any soil being added. Um, the nature of what they're doing is to kind of shape it. It's being an unshaped piece of of, of soil going up. Yeah. What uh, they need Mike, to be able to do is just. Yep. Abby, did you lose him there for a minute? Yeah, I saw Abby said that we, we lost council chambers there for a minute. Abby and I were still both sort of live, but maybe step back a minute in what you were saying. Okay, and where, where did we lose you? Pretty much when you put your hands up in the air. <laughs> I don't know exactly, sorry. Well, I think what, what Mike was saying about there was no, there would be no actual disturbance of the soil. Um, 
Is that right? Yes. So there's, yeah. So the idea is that there's, um, if there's any disturbance of the soil, then it has to have a hearing. And so that's where we're uh, pretty much where, where we were at was this, this should have required a hearing and, uh, and now it's up to kind of the board to make a decision on, um, should there be an engineer's report and should there be, should there, should, does this count as the hearing or should there be another hearing? Um, there's kind of a couple of decision points for you to make. Okay. So the board, board members sort of understand where we're at as far as, uh, you know, a hearing for steep slopes provision uh, does this count as the hearing? We don't have to decide that now, I don't think. Um, but um, just maybe you make sure you have enough information to make that decision later. Kevin, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, Rob, I have a question. Um, I, I I was curious to know more about um, Mike's comment that it wouldn't disturb the soil is that because the equipment is just intended to how how does that work that it yep. wouldn't disturb the soil disturb the soil so they're gonna there's they were bringing in an excavator to shape so they weren't going to bring in any soil and they weren't removing any soil but what they did need to do is to it, my understanding and maybe arthur can correct me if i'm wrong just to, to kind of you know move some stumps, move some soil, move some rocks, but you're kind of moving things a little bit to make a clearer path. So that way the tract equipment can drive in and drive out. It's not, it's not making a road. It's not installing, um, you know, it's just, it's just in order to get the tract equipment to go up, you kind of gotta, you know, it'll be uneven and you're just going to kind of move some dirt. So that way it makes a kind of a straighter, flatter path for the tract equipment to, to work its way in and out. Does it have to be graded? Does the slope have to be graded at all? Uh, maybe that's a little bit of a technical question for Arthur. I, I believe it's okay. not graded. It's just being shaped in order to allow the equipment. To that's, that's my understanding as well. I'm not the excavator operator. I'm, you know, so I can't, you know, specify it in, the, in that level of technicality. Perhaps what I was told as we walked through it, he indicated where he pulled soil from one spot and put it and create kind of a bench for the vehicles to go up. We we're talking about a six foot wide path that would be going sort of diagonally up the path. And then, you know, to, to ensure like we would, you know, wherever there are divots from that moving of soil, that would probably be smoothed out. I don't know if that counts as grading or not, uh, but that, you know, that the intent there is just to like, one make it disappear into the bank um after it's you know after it's been used and to you know be as intrusive as least intrusive as possible Thanks. No. go ahead abby uh that was it thank you kevin do you have anything yeah i just uh I recommend that we take all all evidence possible and then adjourn to uh deliberative session, deliberative session. Okay. This is definitely a deliberative yeah. session. Um, uh, I was just going to say, I feel like I've got the, the information I need for us to sort of hammer out the technical regulatory details of how all of this uh, sort of interacts with the zoning ordinance. Um, and so I, I would... just want to add one other thing. Yep. In Arthur's application, he said the divot will not be disturbed. It is impossible to create a bench and not disturb the divot. Mm -hmm. That is an impossible activity. So when you're deliberating, I want you to think about water coming down on both sides. And we know water's coming down on the right side 24 seven. I don't know where it's coming from. Water's coming from underneath my house and water is coming down the right of way until it was pushed into the divot. And it makes me very, very concerned. Very concerned. So concerned that I've notified my home insurance company about this situation. And they were very, very pleased that I notified them. And they told me exactly what to do. Because I know this neighbor 
And he will say, well, you have to prove it, that it's the water from my project that's causing you difficulty. And so I have, have worked to get the proof together beforehand and then after. And I really just don't want to go through that, but my home insurance said, you are doing the right thing. And um, it's very unfortunate because Mr. Fulch has lived there for about, oh, I would say you could ask him 10 years. And he did a great big project building a retaining wall behind his house. Well, if he hadn't built that retaining wall, he could have pulled up. You know, there's plenty of room for access, but he put in a big retaining wall. So I am dealing with a neighbor that doesn't plan, and I'm not going to be the scapegoat for his lack of planning. That's where we're at. And the other thing is that the neighbor on the other side of Arthur I think we really have put to up a solar on, array on point with these. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. And did not need a machine. So and I think Gene, right. Gene has a question too. Yeah, so. before we go into deliberative, um, just because I've been looking at this uh, site in detail with the with the Google map. So someone raised a question on whether would was there any other alternatives as far as putting putting the solar on the roof or beyond 25 Cliff Street? Is there any other point of access that wouldn't be as, as steep or as disturbing to to access the rear of the of the property? Yeah. You know, Gene, I I think that those are interesting questions, but I, I also think that there might be outside of sort of the, the purview and the reasons why we're why we're here. Um, and so I would thank everyone for their, uh, um, you know, participation uh, this evening uh, on this matter. Um, and so I, would I did, I did want to, before we yep. um, move out, to, so th there's a second point. So there were two, two points, which one we, you noted on page four about the steep slopes. And the second is on page seven regarding erosion control. They're both very related issues, but they're technically two separate issues. So, um, I just wanted to make sure that we, um, on the record, we, we mentioned that there, the second one is whether or not there should be an erosion control plan, which basically this discussion follows a very similar one that we had about the steep slopes and that Meredith consulted with the city's um, operation manager and engineer who's a registered um, licensed engineer in Vermont and he reviewed the erosion control plans and uh, he's continued to monitor the plants and, and is aware of the fact that those the snowplow has taken out that um, silt fence and they're in touch with Arthur and said he there's no sense putting the fence back up until the snow starts to melt because the ground underneath is currently frozen and is, isn't going anywhere and putting up the silt fence now and the snow banks is just going to get taken out and it's not serving any purpose so um, the public works will continue to be in touch with Arthur over the winter to continue to monitor it and make recommendations on that. I have to disagree. Okay. The erosion structure was down yeah. before the snow came. That I'm clear about. It had nothing to do with the snow. The, the erosion structure was not built to withstand the steep bank. And then the snowplow, yes, took it out because you would just expect that to happen. So Alrighty. I would uh, entertain a motion for the board uh, to, to move on unless uh, any board member feels like they need any more information and have any more questions. Does Gene still have his hand up or does Gene I mean, which have case, another? No, I'm sorry, I gotta get the hand down. I, I'd uh, like to motion to go into deliberate session. But we will be doing, we'll do that after yeah. Fred. Close the public hearing and then go into deliberative session. Right, Gene, okay. do you step, accept that friendly amendment for your motion that uh, we will close the public hearing and we'll go into the deliberative session at the end of uh, tonight's regular meeting? 
That would be my amended uh, motion. You okay with that, Dean? Yes. Second. Uh, to the amended. Dean, you still need a second? That, that'll be me. Kevin, second from Kevin. Um, okay, Kevin, how do you vote? Yes. Michael? Yes. Joe? No. Abby? Yes. Catherine? Yes. Yes. Joe there or is Joe at? We lost Joe. Oh, there he is. Joe, we can't seem to hear you. Joe can't hear you. We have enough votes. Well, can we get a thumb, some thumbs up? Thumbs up from Joe. We can see you if you want to do a thumbs up if it's a yes. Okay. No. Do this thing. So, oh, and there there Rob, uh, that motion uh, to um, take this up in deliberative session um, for the public hearing now um, approved unanimously. Um, so, we will be discussing this after tonight's meeting. And, uh, you will be hearing from the planning department at some point in the coming weeks. Specifics on the process of yeah, the appellants. Uh, no, this will be. Uh, if the decision is rendered tonight, I'll be starting to work on the writing up the decision and, and Rob will get with Rob to get that signed and we'll get that out to the applicant and the appellant. Um, as uh, appeals are uh, work the same way as any DRB decision, there's a, a 30 day appeal window on these. So uh, once this decision is signed, it'll be 30 days and um, either appealed or the permit will be valid or denied. Uh, Susan, thank you very much for Thanks, coming in this evening. Oh, and uh, okay. thank you. I wish you the, you the best with the rest of this. Uh, board members, I would entertain a motion for a five minute recess as we have to shuffle staff um, around here uh, in between applications. Uh, so so uh, we'll just do that by, yeah, you know, by unanimous consent. Uh, consent. Yeah. Uh, and uh, that's resumed at 8.10 in this room, which is seven minutes. Okay. So, uh, yeah, we'll see you all at 8.10. Welcome back. I believe we have everybody uh, present here. Um, I don't know. I haven't, I don't know if Abby and Ka I don't know if our actual board members are yeah, back. Yeah, I'm just checking. Yeah. Eugene's here. Abby's here. Catherine, are you back? Michael's here. He just unmuted himself. Yeah, I'm here. Yep. Awesome. Joe's back. I'm not Catherine, though. No. Just got to wait for Catherine. I'm here. Alrighty. Awesome. We're all set. And there's a bunch of people to swear in this time around. Yeah. <laughs> so it is now. Um, past 810. Uh, we're going to call this meeting uh, back to order. Thank you all for being patient while we had a little recess. Um, so our next application this evening is uh, for a conditional use approval on Granite Shed Lane in Montpelier. And um, anyone who is here to uh, speak on this application? Um, together with Jeff Oleski. So Jeff Oleski is the only one speaking. Is anyone uh, else going to speak? And Fred, yeah. Is anyone else from the applicant going to speak this evening or a uh, member of the public? So just uh, Jeff Oleski and Fred O'Connor will be uh, uh, sworn in. Uh, Phyllis, will either you or Paige want to talk for the Montpelier Conservation Commission or for yourselves? Maybe. <laughs> okay. Let's swear them in. They well, don't have to. Yeah. Just swear you all in, just because it's easier. I don't think I'm going to speak. I'll I'll let Paige speak. I, That's this is Phyllis. Thank you, Phyllis. Okay. So we are uh, now Just swearing in. Paige. Paige, Burton. Fred, Jeff, Steve has his hand up. Yep. And then if John or Michael need to speak, we can swear them in at that time. 
All those interested in providing testimony on this application, would you please raise your right hand uh, to be sworn in as witness? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth under the pains and penalties of perjury? I do. Yes. Yes. Ready. Thank you very much. Um, so I will, with the those speaking on the application, would you just introduce yourself real quickly? Fred Connor. Fred Connor and. And my name is Jeff. Oh, go ahead, Steve. Stephen Connor. And my name is Jeff Olasky with Catabound Consulting Engineers, uh, the civil engineer for the project. Uh, and so, Meredith, you want to give a brief overview of the status of where we're at on this application? Yep. Um, so the, the staff report goes into some of the history for the project. I think I might let Fred or Jeff talk about most of the history. Um, in general, as Rob started to say, this is an application for major site plan review and uh, conditional use approval. Um, tied in with that is also a request for some permitted uses that normally would just be administrative approvals, but they're all part of the review for the major site plan and what is planned to be done for the outside of the building, as well as the site itself, landscaping, lighting, parking, stormwater, all of those things come into play here. Um, and in the the things like parking, you have to evaluate those based on the uses. So everything is included in this approval package. That doesn't mean that the board has to approve all of those parts, right? So they could approve the major site plan request along with the permitted uses being requested um, and then decide, you know, decide how they want to deal with the conditional uses. There's, there's a mix of things that the board could do here. Um, as summarized in the staff report, there is some administrative permit history with this project um, because this is all part of a brownfield um, redevelopment project. There's a corrective action plan. Um, and so we've had back and forth with the applicant on various small parts of the project that had to get dealt with so that they could um, clean up the underlying site as well as some needs because some of the um, sort of out kind of outbuildings, but really the the additions that were put on the building that are the smaller sort of elbows, you know, shoulders to the building um, when Connor Brothers bought it were in really bad disrepair. And so administratively we have approved some removals of roofs and some some small demolition where those demolitions never triggered actual major site plan and some rebuilding of the shell um, with caveats that Fred had to come back when he was ready or Connor Brothers had to come back when they were ready and had a sense of what they were going to actually do with the rest of the site. Um, it, it really it just it wasn't triggering that full review, but we knew it was coming. Um, so that's what we have here. Um, it is still sort of a speculative approval because they don't have a tenant. So that's where some of the complications come into play here and why there are sections with a lot of red where the board's going to have to figure out whether or not to approve certain items that are mostly tied to the p potential uses. And if so, especially with the conditional uses, how to condition them in a way um, to, to deal with the things like traffic um, and other things that come into play when you start having a conditional use. So it's, it's a little bit more of a puzzle piece for the board than I think normally comes before it. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think just to note here um, that there's a number of issues in this application. You could actually say that this could be three different applications in one uh, with some different issues. And so, um, you know, I just would like to, uh, ahead of time, uh, just apologize to the applicant and thank you for your patience. We may not get through everything this evening, um, you know, it's just possible. Um, and that's nothing to do with uh, your preparedness or anything like that. That's just um, us, uh, you know, going through our process and uh, trying not to make decisions while we're falling asleep. So um, that being said, 
Um, we will turn it over to the applicant if you want to give a presentation and overview of what you're proposing to do and uh, try to address any concerns you think you can uh, right off. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Fred Connor and I'm representing the owner, which is Connor Brothers Redevelopment Company, Wall uh, together with my three brothers, Steve, Mike, and John. And we're joined by our civil engineer, uh, Jeff Oleski, who is the owner of Catamount Consulting Engineers. Uh, I'd like to briefly introduce our company and the project and then turn it over to Jeff to uh, ask him to walk us through the site plan. Connor Contracting Inc., uh, our, our general contracting and construction management company is 32 years old. We have 30 employees, very talented employees, and we maintain offices and support space in both Berlin and St. Albany. Uh, each year, redevelopment projects uh, for reach to third parties is part of the mix of projects that we uh, undertake. Uh, this is our fifth such project in Montpelier, and uh, it's been my family's, uh, my immediate family's since 1998. Uh, I wanted to just comment on one project that's in the neighborhood, which is uh, 575 Stonecutters Way. It's similar to this one in that it was a speculative venture, and uh, with the DRB support, we were able to get the building shelled up, and then we were able to secure uh, two tenants, the Chancellor's Office and the Vermont State Colleges, and also the Vermont Office of the Nature Conservancy. Um, so while that's not preferred to build on spec, it's proved in this marketplace uh, to be a successful uh, recipe in some cases. Uh, next week is our second anniversary of our purchase of the former Montpelier Grant Work. The closing was on Valentine's Day 2020, just before the start of the pandemic. Uh, this is a unique and special property and we feel privileged to be able to take on the challenge of bringing it back to productive use. Uh, we look forward to receiving your support for this downtown Brownfield redevelopment project. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff to ask him to provide us with an overview of the proposed site plan. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Fred. Um, again, just for the record, my name is Jeff Alecki with Catamount Consulting Engineers. Um, I think in the spirit of the time uh, and uh, of this evening, I'll try to start this off with a very brief overview of the project, uh, the existing proposed conditions. I feel like probably everybody's at least familiar with the location of the site, but uh, we're talking about 43 and what used to be 65 at Shed Lane, um, two old uh, granite workhouse warehouses. Um, and the Connors, as Meredith kind of outlined, have periodically um, pecked off and pulled some of the uh, old debilitated portions of the buildings, um, as well as the entire uh, building that was previously known as 65 Granite Shed Lane and, and raised and removed the structures um, and are now to a point where they're looking at, at really getting to the site redevelopment. Um, as you're aware within the application and as Meredith outlined, there's no uh, hard tenant at this location right now. Um, really, Connors are attempting to uh, procure a permit or permits uh, in place so that they can make the lot more marketable uh, for potential clients. And as outlined within the application, there certainly are some preferred and suggested uses. Um, and we'll get into those in some more detail throughout the night, I'm sure. Um, but what the application uh, from a civil site standpoint involves right now is really retaining the existing building shell, which is uh, which is left right now, I believe is um, 14,700 square feet of building. Um, and that existing footprint that is shown on the existing site plan would be retained in its, in its full capacity. Um, there are some additional structures. There's a craneway support, uh, partly roofed, approved, uh, that are being uh, proposed to be retained and potentially worked into some type of site development. Um, and I'll, I'll let Fred maybe speak to that a little bit as far as what some of those uses could be. But then really to support the building and any potential use, uh, looking at uh, really formalizing two parking lots, one on the north side, one on the south side, um, and then redoing some of the municipal utilities, namely the water and the sewer. Um, we have, uh, the building currently is on both municipal water and sewer. Uh, we'd be looking just to reconstruct those and upgrade them to today's standards, uh, make sure they're viable for whatever potential tenant goes into this space, um, and, uh, you know, really just clean up the site as a whole. Uh, there's were considerable drainage um, deficiencies in the property beforehand. 
Um, and what we're attempting to do is, uh, with a lot of that site redevelopment, is uh, not only treat some stormwater runoff, but also uh, convey it down to the Winooski River in a safe and manageable um, manner. And I know that was outlined in, uh, in some of the staff comments, as well as some of the conservation committee comments. And uh, again, we can get into some of those in more detail um, as we go through the night here, but really the intent of the stormwater design was to um, not point collect, but uh, really um, conquer and divide and provide some on-site um, uh, green stormwater treatment techniques on site before safely conveying it down to the river. And we felt we've accomplished that with the, uh, you know, the current stormwater design, understanding that uh, we're without, out of the threshold of any state discharge or stormwater permit. Um, I guess at this point, I'm, I'm happy, Meredith, I don't know if you have the existing and proposed site plan of Palop, or I can certainly screen share them if it's easier. Um, I thought it might make sense to just kind of bring those up so we could take a look at them together briefly. If you could pull them up, that would be helpful. Okay, yep. Um, so bear with me, I'm gonna just pull up, uh, start with the existing condition here. Um, Sorry, Jeff, I know usually I'm in a space to be able to do it, but it's a lot of files this time around. <laughs> yeah, and can everybody see this right now? Um. Kind of, yes. Uh, hold on, let me turn off the lights. Yeah. Oh, yes. Can't see us, but that's okay. Ooh, this is an interesting reverse view. Black. I know. That being, with that being said, uh, I also thought it may be easier, is it easier in black and white, or is the color... Um, uh, I don't even know. That's a little... Because we're also having there, I can look on my computer screen, but everybody else is looking, um, or at least everybody else in this room is looking at yeah. a big projection. So yeah, I think uh, that might be better for us there. The, the black and white. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Color was pretty neat, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you just got a backseat view to what us engineers look at all every day. So, um, but so yeah, I mean, what we're we're talking about here is, is you know. Um, if you're looking at this plan, uh, we have the Winooski River to the southwest of the property and a, a steep bank that kind of goes in the top of the bank uh, where the building was in the buildings and lot was predominantly built out um, down to the river. And then we have Granite Shed Lane on the northeast side of the property. Um, and that's, again, it's not a, uh, I don't believe it's a public road, obviously, but it's uh, essentially a shared right of way um, with, I believe, in fact, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's four or five properties maybe around, along should line and you're the second within those uh, to all benefit from their shared right away um, and that kind of runs along the railroad tracks here um, on the northeast side and uh, as it stands right now this, the, the shaded area you see here in the middle is the main building uh, that's the 14,000 square foot of building that remains uh, this smaller shaded area here is the covered crane way and then there's some additional um, non-roof structural supports over here. Uh, but right now, the area to the south and the area to the north are really just big gravel parking lots. Um, and uh, so I'm just gonna switch over to the proposed site plan. Uh, you kind of see what the site development looks like. Um, really, it's just a formalization of this. So we've got uh, 39 parking spaces on the northeast, uh, I'm sorry, northwest side of the proposed building with a main entrance uh, being right here on kind of northwest side. And then there'd be a second parking lot on the southeast side of the building that would have a couple different access points on the, on the southeast side. Uh, the loading dock area would be here on the, the far east corner of the building with the concept of, of trucks pulling down Granite Shed Lane and simply backing into the space before utilizing the southern parking lot to do a three-point turn and, and uh, exit back down Granite Shed Lane as it's a one-way dead-end road. Um, you know, in, in the municipal water and sewer services that are located on the north uh, corner of the building uh, are the locations where we'd be looking to upgrade the water and sewer services. And then, uh, you know, we're obviously proposing a significant amount of landscaping on the property, um, both along the north and south property lines to provide some aesthetic screening of these properties to the adjacent neighbors to the southeast and northwest, as well as some street trees along the front 
we have the space capacity to do it. Um, and, and I know we'll get more into that, that requirement specifically um, as we go through the staff notes later on. But, um, you know, that's the, the general layout in a nutshell. Um, nothing's really changing with the building, really just formalizing the parking areas and then um, doing some utility upgrades. Uh, one last thing I will mention with regards to stormwater, how it'll be managed is the whole north parking lot here will all be shallow sheet flowed into a long ground rail that runs this whole property line along the north or northwest side. Um, so it'll be a shallow, gradual, infiltrative swale with overflow discharging through a small stone swale down the riverbank here, which is one of the two areas that required us to impact those 30% slopes um, and, and have the conservation committee yeah. review it. And then the secondary is, is the um, south parking lot uh, here will, because of grade issues um, and not being able to sheet flow and drain everything to this far south end, we do have a small collection system, uh, a catch basin and under drain, uh, underground collection system that would discharge to a stone dispersion uh, swale uh, or outlet right here. And so that's the second location uh, of 30% slope that would need to be impacted. And these have been and sized and minimized uh, to all ability to, to minimize impact within the riparian buffer and this in the steep bank areas while still we feel uh providing a safe conveyance for the stormwater out to the river um and then the last part of this uh, parking lot here would actually sheet flow and be treated with a grab disconnection area uh, as this is all predominantly lawn on this far south corner of the building um creates a brief overview of the existing proposed uh condition site plan I guess, Meredith, at this point, I'll, I'll maybe stop screen sharing and hand it back over to you. And I don't know if you want to, at this point, go through the staff notes in any particular order or run through them. If you want us to lead that discussion or if you want to lead discussion, uh, happy to proceed however way the board prefers. Yeah, I think we can, uh, unless board members have any questions right off, uh, based just clarifying the previous presentation, we can uh, jump into the staff report here. I don't see any hands, so I think you can jump Perfect. in, Rob. Um, so it is the first issue in the staff report, and since we have the, um, you know, couple members of the Conservation Commission here, I think the, the first issue it makes to, sense to sort of talk about is uh, uh, starting on page uh, seven of the staff report, um, we have uh, the water setback area. So do you want to give like a just a brief little <laughs> little tutorial tutorial on the water setback as we do this application Meredith yeah a little reminder for for board members um, that uh, all properties that have you know waters streams rivers flowing across them um, in Montpelier where they've been recognized on our our natural resources inventory map have water setbacks um, and depending on what zoning district you're in, that setback area varies. Um, and there's limitations on what you can do within that setback area. Um, this property is within the riverfront district. So that setback, the water setback is 20 feet. That's measured from the top of the bank of the river. The first 10 feet of that water setback is referred to as a riparian buffer. So from the top of the bank in towards the building for 10 feet or into the property for 10 feet, there's a riparian buffer that has even greater limitations on what you can do in it. And one of those limitations is that the, the, the regulations really want those first 10 feet to, if at all possible, be kept to natural woody vegetation, except in very limited circumstances. Um, and you know, some of those those circumstances are for water dependent uses um, and and other related items. Um, the board has previously approved um, stormwater outfalls, drainage, things like this to the river in those riparian buffers. Um, it it really makes sense because then you're not having water discharged and erode a long way. You also don't have a direct pipe, right? It actually slows down the water discharge a little bit. So Previously, we have considered these these stormwater outfalls to basically be water dependent structures or uses, even though it's not a you know boat access or swimming access or something like that. But we do need the conservation commission's comments 
um, any time that someone wants to remove woody vegetation from that riparian buffer zone. And so I forwarded the application on to the Conservation Commission, and they kindly held a special meeting last week to consider it. And everybody should have gotten a copy of the Conservation Commission's letter. Fred and Jeff, you got that as well, correct? You got the email? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. I circulated it to all the board members. Um, and we have their comments. They have some some ideas and some thoughts about how to deal with it. And I think probably better to hand it over to Paige at this point. Absolutely. Go ahead, Paige. Um, okay. Well, you have read read the comments. Um, one thing I'd like to point out, and partly uh, looking at the picture that Fred sent out the other day, uh, which uh, showed the building that extends back actually into the setback and actually into the riparian area that's going to be retained. Um, I, we didn't have any objection to that, but I believe, and this is actually not in our, our message. I drove by that property last night and noticed this and then went back and looked at that picture and noticed it again. There is almost no woody vegetation on the bank or in the riparian area. And I believe that that building extending into the riparian area makes this a non-conforming um, non riparian area uh, for which 3005 sub G sub three requires that woody vegetation be restored on the riparian area. And I would strongly encourage that. It would help a lot with water running off the parking, especially the, the uh, southeast parking lot that basically has a, a 1990s storm drain system that collects water in catch basins and runs it directly into the river, which is not the best way to do it. But if there were a woody area over there um, that could capture some of the water that is going to sheet flow off of that uh, parking lot into the grassy area, that would, that would help. Um, and it would also help hold the bank and um, and contain some of the stormwater. And then the other the other um, major part of the proposal was to do some additional green stormwater infrastructure, as much as you can do given the the um, contaminated contaminated nature of the soil underneath the site. Um, to put some more green water storm green stormwater infrastructure in the swale on the northwest side. Um, that would slow the water and filter it even further because otherwise, if it's just grass, the water's not really going to infiltrate very well. Um, so if you had some more vegetation, possibly some shrubs, there's there are people in town who can tell you who what some of the good plants are to put in there. Um, uh, to plant some more in that swale to slow and filter the water running off since you are sheet flowing that whole Northwest parking lot into that swale, which is, you know, which is better than running it directly into the river. Thank you. Um, but it's not, it doesn't filter it or infiltrate it in a grassy area. Um, so that would be a recommendation. Um, uh, another recommendation we have um, definitely limit the what it, removing woody vegetation on the in the riparian area and frankly I don't think you're going to find much um, but restore any any vegetation that's disturbed during the construction um, uh, perhaps thinking about planting clover instead of grasses on the in the southeast corner there in particular and the grassy area behind the parking lot um, it would uh, probably improve filtration in that area. Um, check for the presence of invasive species on the riparian buffer and perhaps develop a plan to remove some of them and plant native species over time. It would improve the health of the bank and the health of the water. Um, uh, I don't know about commercial uses on this, but when I daylighted a footing drain into the Otter Creek uh, about 15 years ago, it had to daylight somewhere between 25 and 50 feet away from the water. And so I, I would confirm the legal requirement of daylighting the drains directly into the river. Um, 
um, also verified the, that your fertilizer isn't going to impact the water quality. And, um, and there was, oh, and, and um, perhaps have somebody help you determine plants to put in the soil. And all those are going to make a difference in the stormwater and the quality of the stormwater, because as we noted in the beginning, uh, water running off a parking lot, even though the impervious surface is the same area as the building that was there, water running off a parking lot is far more polluted than water running off a roof. I think, I think that's, can you think of anything else, Phyllis? Uh, I think you covered it all, Paige. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so if I, can, if I can ask the chair, I'd just like to respond. Yes, uh, absolutely. Jeff, go ahead. Um, it's uh, Fred, Fred Connor. Uh, oh, okay. Jeff and I have uh, reviewed, yeah. reviewed the Conservation Commission's letter. Uh, we appreciate that they met uh, on, this, on the topic. Uh, we forwarded that letter to our uh, landscape architect. And jumping ahead a bit, uh, assuming we're not going to be in a position to get a favorable decision tonight, Due to timing and some other information issues that we have since we got uh and we appreciate greatly uh meredith's efforts as well but we received the conservation commission letter this morning and we received the staff report uh while we were moving snow around on friday so uh i, I think we're going to be requesting a continuance to your next meeting which i understand to be march 7th uh and during that time we would uh, give a thoughtful reply to both uh the conservation commission uh, and the uh, staff report. I think our the 21st is going to be. So, so Fred, um, yes. right now at the bottom of our agenda, it said that the meeting on the 22nd of this month is canceled, but that was because there's no applications. So if you thought you would be ready by February 22nd, we can continue this to then and meet then, or you could opt to go into March. I think that's really your, whatever you felt you would be ready for um we can certainly make that timeline and would appreciate the earlier date please yeah, yeah. I, I mean that's that was only canceled because we didn't have any new applications okay. i don't think we're going to get through the this volume is small everything tonight anyway so that yeah. would work well i think if we can get a sort of a general outline as to what the uh, what the plan is and what the issues are yep. yeah what, that, that would be a yep. that would be a realistic goal for yep. this perfect uh, for this hearing well let's keep okay. keep moving along here uh so <clears throat> did, did you fred do you have thoughts specifically about the riparian discussion or do you want to i, I just to just give a, a very brief bit of context uh part of our emergency repairs to the building was a completely new roof system uh but we also had to eliminate the post and beam uh, framing on the east end of the building near the river uh, on the whole first floor and jack up the building and replace concrete and timber framing uh, because that's the place where the uh, 10 foot diameter saw that's fed with water would run every night for 75 years and those those uh, post and beam uh, members uh, were just about dust they were staying up by habit so um, so that's the kind of work that we had to do there we also demolished a 14 foot deep uh, addition that is not coming back. So we're increasing the uh, the green space on that end of the building. It was about 14 by 60, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And Fred, if I could just uh, piggyback on those comments a little more, uh, and this is kind of just address some specific comments, Meredith, within the staff report, but I, I think at one point you were looking for some uh, confirmation on some numbers with regards to uh, the existing or proposed riparian buffer impacts. And I just want to confirm, ultimately what we're proposing is 145 square feet of, of uh, riparian buffer impact, but that is not within the first 10 feet of the, of the water setback, so it's outside. Um, so there's really no proposed impact in that first 10 feet. And uh, the only additional existing impact, there's about 534 square feet of craneway uh, roof that is within that 20 foot uh, river setback. Uh, but again, that's existing um, uh, condition. And then on top of that, and I think this kind of uh, is what Fred was just alluding to is what a portion of the existing building to the Southwest that was previously administratively approved uh, and was removed. And that was about 570 square feet in total. 
of which 442 square feet was within the riparian buffer and has since been removed and returned to green space. Um, you know, so there already have been some mitigation efforts uh, within the previous administrative approval of, um, you know, take back some of that riparian buffer in, in that space above the top of the bank there. Um, and uh, along those same lines, uh, with regards to the Conservation Committee's comments, uh, we did forward those to the landscape architect who designed and developed the landscaping plans. He was gracious enough to provide us with a response. Um, and, I, and I think we didn't really have time to turn around that and provide it tonight, but I think there are some thoughtful ways for us to address those comments and concerns with some uh, supplemental revised plans, landscaping plans, um, that'll hopefully address a lot of the conservation uh, committee's comments um, as we move forward here. Yep. So Jeff, just a couple things. Uh, well, I guess, do you think at the next meeting, maybe you could have a little tiny exhibit showing like your square footage and your impacts just to, so we have a picture of where that is. Doesn't need to be fancy, but just so we have a general idea. So like a zoom. Yeah. Um, so the second one is you said 534 feet of the frameway roof. So you're that's you're saying that's like the roof building overhanging into the setback area. Correct. Yeah. So um, if you were to go to the the proposed condition site plan or the uh, um, or really either the site plans, the existing or proposed conditions, you'll see the the river top bank setback established on there, and you can see the portion of the craneway roof that is within that riparian buffer or that uh, that uh, river setback um it's collected off that roof or is just sheet off the edge of it for as as we speak or proposed or as of right now i believe they both just sheet flow that there's no collection system to the craneway structure correct fred that's correct and i just want to add i believe that uh, roof the roof on that piece of uh of the site uh, terminates before the wetland area, but I'm just look, gonna look at the site plan behind me right now. Yeah. Yeah, Jeff, when we get your revised data, I think it probably for for looking at the the nonconformity within the riparian buffer, um, that page did did confirm and I didn't mention it in the staff report. There's lots of stuff going on here. Um, how much of the craneway roof is in the water setback as a whole, right? So that's the 20 foot versus some of that looks like it actually does intrude maybe into the riparian buffer area, that first 10 feet. When we when we were talking about what's in the riparian buffer before, I was thinking about the new impervious surfaces, right? Um, and those those are really just the, the outfalls because the... Um, stretch of pavement doesn't get into the riparian buffer that was stayed in the water setback but yep. it is right that the part of that craneway roof looks like it is into the riparian buffer so if we could have that breakdown on the separation there for the total square footage that would be great. yeah and I'll, i mean i can summarize it but it, essentially the, the craneway there's 534 square feet of craneway in the river setback and 200 square feet of that is within the riparian buffer Perfect. Thank you. No, nope. Meredith, just for context here, are there any uh, sort of uh, river corridor or flood plain stuff done administratively on this project? Uh, only the approval to demolish the part where Fred was talking about was the shed, yeah. right? And that was also lower. Okay. Um, that was in the um, flood plain yep. river corridor. And so Audra was part of yeah. getting a permit to get that demolished and pulled out yeah. and none of the rest of the structures fall okay. into there and there's um the the line for that is on the site yep. plan yep thank you yep you're welcome can i just say that we do appreciate what connors have done uh along the riverbank and also the fact that they're restoring a historic structure i think it's great and i should have said that in the first place so thank you <laughs> thank you um okay i mean this so the next item in the staff report is the uh steep slopes here um which i think you kind of covered it in your presentation um but just maybe to confirm it the only site work proposed in those steep slopes appears to be your construction of these outlets 
um, and not really any grading beyond that, but maybe I'm wrong. No, that's correct. I mean, uh, again, just with the um, nature of the stormwater collection and discharge here and understanding we do have a deep bank, you know, I, I think um, in total the elevation change from the ordinary high water level to the top of the bank is somewhere in the neighborhood of say eight to 10 feet. Um, you know, we're really uh, trying to be uh, cognizant and aware of not creating any type of discharge at the top of these banks that would cause potential erosion of the banks and, and ultimately uh, um, compromise any portion of the property. So, uh, you know, what we're proposing from a stormwater management standpoint, we feel is kind of the bare minimum um, impact on these slopes uh, necessary to safely convey the water in either location. So again, on the north side, we're simply proposing a, a small swale, stone swale uh, from the top of the bank to the bottom bank with the total area of that being about 75 square feet. Um, and then on the south side, um, you know, just all, all that would be necessary to essentially trench and install that stormwater pipe outlet and then have a stone dispersion pad at the bottom of, or the, the, the end of that outlet pipe uh, that's about 20 square feet. So really, um, you know, uh, the limits of disturbance are outlined in the EPSC plans, but we're doing everything we can to minimize that bank. And, and then obviously we'd be reestablishing the bank and, and um, stabilizing it as part of the reconstruction process um, and confirming that everything is revegetated and stabilized before putting it to bed. So, um, you know, along those same lines, we're also trying to, we've got three different kind of discharges to the, the curve here in, in an attempt to not all centralized and collect into one pipe in, in one discharge location um, as part of these green stormwater infrastructure techniques. Um, so it's a little bit of a balancing act and uh, just using best engineering practice uh, in an attempt to A, allow the site to drain properly, which it doesn't always do now, and B, do it in a manner that doesn't compromise the water quality or the, you know, the bank itself. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so I, as far as steep slopes or the river or uh, drainage and erosion. The board members have any questions while we're here? I think uh, oh, I'm moving along. Move Alrighty. it along. <laughs> yeah. There's some, you know, sections here in the staff report about drainage. And I think you've done a really good job of explaining it all so far. So um, I think we can, can move on here in the next section. Uh, Following along, we're on page 12, um, and it's access and circulation. Um, and uh, I think that this is a good segue into looking at the proposed uses. So maybe I would have you sort of um, skip ahead and talk about the potential uses here and maybe give us some more information on that. I'm sorry, you're talking to me or Meredith? I couldn't, I'm, I apologize. I think I'd be. I think coming from the applicant as far as proposed uses would be. Yeah. I'd to weigh in on that. Um, we think highest and best use uh, could be a, a brewery and a riverfront restaurant. Um, we've we've uh, toured the site with a couple of brewers. Um, they both want to stay where they are. Um, but we, um, we think there is the potential for that. We're not married to it, but we're, you know, we're, and we're exploring a lot of other potential uses as well. Um, but that, that's, that's a use that could have some, uh, some appeal and interest by the community, I believe. Yeah. And Fred, just, to, uh, you know, as far as the application is concerned, you know, outlined, you know, obviously we're applying for several permitted and conditional uses. And, that, and those are page two of the cover letter that went in with the application originally uh, on December 23rd, but, um, you know, I think as it relates to the conditional use review, as Meredith outlined at the beginning of this, you know, the approach we took in not only in the original application, as well as our uh, technical review committee discussions was uh, really to take a look at all these different conditional use criteria and then kind of come up with a, what's the worst case scenario with regards to a potential use for different um, criteria, so to speak. Um, and, and, um, I think it, you know, obviously there's parking to consider, there's traffic to consider. Um, and, and I think those are the two primary ones. Um, I think that ultimately need to be hashed out a little bit here, but 
Um, in general, as part of the, our review with the technical review committee, we talked about trip generation and uses. I think, in, Fred, correct me if I'm wrong, but the concept would be any type of brewery slash restaurant would be for about 4,700 square feet of this building to be used, that use and storefront, so to speak, with the remaining 10,000 being used for the manufacturing and production and storage of, of the beer or uh, restaurant component of it. And um, so we've kind of taken that breakdown because it's an easy, two easy numbers to work with and kind of run through the parking analysis and traffic analysis on those. Again, understanding we're dealing in hypotheticals here a little bit, but um, you know, I think we've, and again, I don't know if we want to hash, rehash specifics right now, but that was a lot of the discussion that happened at the, the technical review committee and, and I think the thresholds that Meredith put in place within the staff comments that I think, and again, Fred, correct me if I'm wrong, that you know we were comfortable with um, working with or adhering to if, if a positive outcome on the overall uh, application could be, you know, seen. So, yeah, we, we understand from the uh, staff report that uh, basically we we're, we're free to request up to up to forty nine uh, trips per day, but then if we come in with uh, something greater than that, that that would be subject to. Uh, the zoning administrator's review. Um, it's it's and those break down to be uh, fifty because we're on Granite Street, seventy five if we're on more of a a, 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 a different class road. Um, just before so. we get too much into the uh, you know the traffic and the trip counts, I just wanted to sort of overview on the uses. So, in your um, cover letter, your application, you list um, you know for permitted uses retail sales and service for the indoor um, office, restaurant, restaurant takeout, food service contractor, laboratory or technical facility. Um, and then uh, for conditional uses, uh, be contractor's yard, with or without storage, light manufacturing, manufacturing, warehouse or storage, wholesale, trade establishment. Um, so are those still in line with what you're proposing? I, I believe uh, after discussions with Meredith, we. Uh... My letter of January 11th uh, revises that that list. It, it, okay. yes. it reduces the number of uses. Yeah. So we it because we had we had there was a lot of back and forth yep. before we triggered the complete application. Yep. Um, so that all those things listed in the original cover letter. Yeah. Those are uses that could happen there. Right. Either administratively approved or conditional uses. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as Fred said, the the pare down for this application yeah. went down to requesting up to 4,700 feet of restaurant, which could be in, you know, eat in or take out and food service contractor. And those three could really be all approved overlapping because those uses could all happen in the same space yeah. almost at the same time. And then up to the 14,700, which is the entire space of manufacturing or warehouse or storage right? right and those are those are uses that we have in the use table it specifically yep. just says manufacturing right but manufacturing can be a bunch of different things which okay. is where where it gets complicated absolutely um i just want to add to that that um, manufacturing includes the used brewery yes and, uh, th this was previously i believe an industrially zone parcel so for for eight for 75 years with this building and another 50 with other buildings it was uh these years of manufacturing and, and warehouse yeah it's un unfortunately you you weren't ready to apply for a use <laughs> within the first 11 months of of owning it and after the previous tenants left got it uh gene has his hand up go ahead gene thanks um so regarding uses and considerations to uses, was there has there any been any consideration or discussion to uh, not necessarily just a use for commercial, but is, is it the potential or consideration for housing? I have to ask that. Uh, yeah, the t the timber frame structure, which if anybody's been in the Vermont Granite Museum, this is a little sister of that building. Uh, it's, that, that one's 300 feet long, this one's 200, that one's a little wider, a little taller. 
but the uh, framing does not lend itself to uh, residential without a lot of rework. It's not quite tall enough to be two legitimate stories. I see. I, I, I thank you. Yep. Okay. Um, so we got talked about the uses here on in relation, we're going to do that in relation to uh, as a primer for access and circulation. Um, I guess this is what asked the question about, um, you know, you talked about parking uh, on site a little bit, uh, but maybe before getting into that, um, you know, pedestrian and bicycle access to this site, obviously, if you're closing restaurant or brewery, or it could be traffic in that nature, proximity to the bike path. Um, do you have any sort of plans or visions for addressing that aspect of access and circulation? Uh, a project we, we may want to explore at some point is uh, the reconstruction of the roadway. Um, each lot, I think there's a half dozen lots, each, each lot's on, on the road, and then all the others have the right to pass and repass. So it would be a half dozen folks that would have to agree, or maybe two or three if it's just on our end, and that would be reconstruction and parking and and uh, paving and we, and we do value our place on the uh, at the start of the new second phase to the Montoya bike path so uh, we do, we do want to facilitate that but right now it's a, it's, a, it's a gravel road it has been for about 150 years uh, did you catch that Rob I did catch that you did okay <laughs> um, board members have any questions at this time uh, so moving down the stop port we have uh, parking and uh, loading areas um, Meredith were there any technical details we really need to address on this uh, specific um, issue no I mean it's it's there's I have a suggestion for a way to, in, in a condition here, t for a way for the board to potentially approve a major site plan with limited parking striping, actual parking spaces striping, um, that would let the applicant have some parking spaces for a more minimal use of the space and then be able to come back in sort of a phased um, adding of parking spaces as they're needed depending on what the ultimate use is. Um, you know, the other, the only other, you know, one of the other funny little things in here is about the electrical vehicle charging stations. I think that because the language says those are for residents or employees, yep. um, it would depend on, on what ultimate use ended up being here. So if it did become a, a big office building with a bunch of employees and they needed, needed 40 parking spaces for those, um, you know, or more, I think it's more than 40 parking spaces, then suddenly they'd be required to put electrical vehicle charging stations in. But I right. don't think that the board really has to pull that trigger at this point. I think that's later. So it's really where you guys fall down on putting a condition on approval. Sure. I don't think this is a big sure. issue. So maybe what you're saying is that the, the specific use hasn't been defined here, so it's hard for us to put conditions on saying exactly uh, what to do because. Uh... <laughs> right, and so I mean, but 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 there is a condition that could be put in yeah. to let them strip some parking spaces so it's more manageable and yeah. able to be leased out, and move forward from there. So that's in and there. A related issue which I had in my letter of January 11th is. Uh, that we are a brownfield project, so we have an EP, US EPA and Vermont DEC approved corrective action plan. And part of that plan involves building this paving in order to be able to encapsulate very low level waste and uh, save it having to be exported. So, yeah, so they, they need to pave the surfaces, but right. they can just hold off on striping all the parking spaces. That also gives them some flexibility if they end up with a use that needs some more truck parking on the other side, or if ultimately they do come back for a contractor's yard approval, they'll have that open paved space to do some out add outdoor storage if they need it. But it gives them flexibility. Right. Um, 
Meredith, just a, a quick confirmation too. Uh, I had a note here on page 19. Uh, you specifically just asked the applicant to confirm the square footage total in the two parking lots, as I think is a relate to maybe uh, uh, landscaping and tree feeding. And, and I just want to let you know we have confirmed that the total parking lot size at 23,300 square feet, um, which again at the 40% is 9,320 square feet, which is uh, less than what's being proposed by a substantial amount, I believe. So um, just as a clarification on that, on page 19 uh, comment, I think we meet that criteria as, as proposed. Thank you. Just to confirm, you said the parking lot total square footage is 23,300 and 40% yep. of that is 9,320? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. And any, and any of the calculations that Jeff's uh, reciting will obviously put in our uh, reply to the staff report. Yep. Okay. Um, well, that um, <laughs> appears to sort of clear up the, the major site plan issues in this uh, application. Uh, no? Street trees. Street trees. But I took care of the shade trees for the parking lot. There's still the street tree question. Uh, we, we'd like to have the opportunity to uh, review that with our landscape architect and go over the go over the comments just to save time tonight. Okay. And, and the same thing in the case of the. Uh, Next item, the lighting. Um, we think we can develop a program for reading the lighting of allowed lumens, but we'd like to save everybody some time and let the pro uh, professional lighting folks look at that and see how we can get that in compliance. Hey, Fred, I don't really mean to overstep. Can I just thought uh, maybe ask a follow up question to that, though? Uh, specifically, the street trees. I, I know we want an opportunity to talk to Terry about it a little bit. Yep. Uh, but it's my understanding in our conversation today that we obviously have a hard time meeting that requirement given the existing lot layout and the orientation of Granite Shed Lane to the, the existing building in the parking lots. Um, if we were going to request that waiver, I feel like we want that on the table now, or do you feel differently about that? No, I, I think we will be, uh, we will formally request the waiver. Uh, I just want to look at it in more detail. Uh, and the way comes right up against our building. So yeah. there, there, is, there is no frontage in front of a building to put any plantings. We've put them where we could, um, and we can't put them on the south side because that's truck access area. So. Oh, right. right. The truck's going to need to be able to back yeah. in there and have the view. Correct. Maybe at the February 22nd meeting, we can address landscaping and uh and lighting with sort of some some new information and new plans and you guys can okay. work on that yeah and i just had one other item i wanted to get in which is uh, we were pleased to report that we do have a certificate of public good for a solar a solar array on the south and the south side of the main roof uh, the roof was designed to accept that and uh, it's a it's a 66 uh kw uh, system that's been uh, appro approved and ready to go. Uh, we would expect to have to work on that uh, with the tenant because the tenant's going to be buying the electricity. Awesome. Great. Kevin, uh, you have any advice on process here where we're at? Well, I, I would uh, uh, just poll all the uh, members and, and see if we have any additional information we want for the application as it stands tonight. Yep. Knowing the uh, uncertainties about the actual end use uh, uh, and so forth. And then, then uh, what I would recommend is that we uh, continue the meeting until, um, until the, next, the next one, which is the 22nd, correct? Yeah. Yes. Board members, uh, get Kevin's uh, recommendation here. Do you hear him? I'm seeing Abby nod. Yeah. It's the 22nd of February. Yep. Yeah, it's yeah. a it's a Tuesday because the city hall is closed on the 21st. Got it. Thank you. Yep. And you would be the only item on the agenda, so we'd be able to get going right away at seven o'clock for you guys. Okay. Thank you. 
So yeah, I mean, I think that segue, I, I kind of feel like with this process, uh, you know, we've kind of sort of almost gone through like a sketch plan you know, uh, if this were a subdivision and we have a real good idea on what you're, what you're up to, what your next steps are. And right. I don't think we see any, you know, glaring issues here. You seem to be on top of the, the major things and um, we really look forward to, you know, seeing the rest of it in a couple of weeks. I, I do have a question. There it is. You can hear the microphone so they can oh. hear you. Uh, has Public Works had a, had a look at this? Oh, yeah. We had a full technical review committee review with multiple members of public review, uh, of, sorry, Department of Public Works being there. We had the chief of police. We had the fire chief. Okay, um, so the full, the full the, the, thing. We had the full thing with the applicants what, represented there, there. Was there a report that uh, so there's a email that's attached in here. It's oh, kind of buried okay. in there. That's a summary that I circulated to everybody to make sure that they okay, had no and other I, comments. I and I've tried to it. work it into the staff report. Um, public, I mean, pu the 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 only big question for Public Works really was the traffic impact because it's hard to tell um, what that's going to be if we don't know what the use is. Right. And the further complication that traffic numbers throughout the state for the last two years have gone down because of COVID. They have not rebounded all the way. And so even the state is pretty much guessing when it comes to the current state of intersections and traffic throughout the state. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's a sense that in Montpelier, traffic is down probably still Five percent or so from where it was two years ago, um, but so really, what we have to look at is the trip generation triggers that we have in the regulation, um, and and it's but again, it's it's speculative based on what the use is. So that that traffic that that traffic review under conditional use is probably the most complicated part of this. Yeah, that's what I would say. You know that, and what other conditions might apply depending on a use. Those are the two biggest question marks that are hardest to solve with a condition. So I guess, I guess with that, maybe uh, Jeff, do you have any additional comments on traffic or you know where you're at now on that design? Um, yeah, and again, you know, obviously we're almost in the same boat. It's hard to buy, uh, without knowing what the final end use is, but we were trying to kind of back our way into some square footage use um, components to the building based on the number of trips. And, and I think that's where I mentioned previously, you know, uh, generally speaking, uh, as far as the triggers for a traffic impact study for AOT, for, as an example, it's, you know, 75 trips, PM, P hour, uh, peak hour trips to trigger a traffic impact study for class one or two roads. Um, and I believe the city of Montpelier um, for class two roads has a, a, a tr essentially a trigger of 50 uh, PM peak trips. And so we were essentially during that technical review committee um, kind of talking through like, well, what could we propose or what percentages of the building we could propose for different uses that would get us under that threshold where theoretically it's something where Meredith could uh, process that administratively or at least have a condition of approval within this conditional use review um, where if whatever the IT trip generation manual said based on the square footage and the ultimate uses of the building, um, if it fell at 49 or lower, then then traffic would essentially be considered a non-issue. Whereas if it went over that and above it, um, you still may be able to permit it, but it would involve coming back for additional conditional use review with the DRB. Um, and that's kind of how we left it. And I think that's kind of Meredith attempted to summarize that within her staff comments here in the uh, in the notes, and I think that all came from the the TRC. And uh, again, I think that's a, a logical approach. It's just we can't get in any more detail without ourselves knowing exactly what's going in there. I guess you know, as a knowing that part of part of town uh, pretty well, I guess the interaction between you know any proposed site uh, improvements and traffic and the Granite Street Bridge and the interaction with co-op traffic, you know, are some things to consider. Um, you know, I think that, um, probably have a flushed out plan at the end. Uh, it's going to address the concerns there, but uh, just know that from riding the bike in that part of town, it's definitely busy as is, uh, but it's not to say that there's no way to engineer around it. Around it. So, good. 
Good luck with that. Uh, I would entertain a motion from the board, I guess. Uh, the board. I'll, I'll make the motion, which is to uh, uh, continue the public hearing on the 43 granite uh, shed road uh, project till our next regularly scheduled meeting, which will be Tuesday, uh, February the 22nd at 7 p.m. Yeah. Okay. Second the motion. Second by Gene. Uh, Kevin, how do you vote? I vote yes. Michael? Yes. Joe? Yes. yes. Uh, Abby? Yes. Catherine? Yes. And Gene? Yes. And Rob votes yes. Uh, it's unanimously approved. We have adjourned this meeting, I guess. Um, well, we've we've both the public part of the meeting the public be part closed, of the meeting. right? Yes. Uh, uh, we, we would actually like the uh, the public hearing to be continued to. Right. Yeah, yeah, no, the public the public hearing done. has just been continued. That's been voted on. We're talking about the public meeting because these guys have to go to deliberative session on the appeal yeah. that you heard earlier. <laughs> <laughs> So, so they yeah. don't get to sign off so, all the way so yet. The fun never ends. <laughs> as far as the uh, um, Granite Shed Lane application goes, we will see you all on the 22nd of February. Uh, Thank you much. And when would you like our materials by? Um, if let's see, the 22nd, we're closed on the 21st. Um, sorry, I'm looking at a calendar that's a long way away. <laughs> uh, I mean, if we can get them, 17. well, at the latest, I'd really need them by the 17th, but feel free to run things by me ahead of time. Um, so that, cause I'm happy to look at things, um, and, and double check things against the regulations. But yeah, the last, the last date really so that we can get them processed and pulled together into a packet and then circulated would probably be the 17th. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that would also, if we have some, you know, we can get it posted on the website so that um, if the Conservation Commission wants to look at it again, or at least the members that were on tonight, they could always come back. Um, the commission itself wouldn't be able to meet again, but individual members could always take a peek at it and comment as members of the public. So thank you very much. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Fred. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I will uh, circulate the the link for the deliberative session um, to the DRB members and to Mike. I will not. I cannot be part of the deliberative session. Um, so there'll be another reshuffling of people. Yes. Um, okay. Do we so have anything else that has to happen? You did the you did the minutes. You did we all did that. the minutes. Okay. We got it. So, yep, everybody. We're set. We're yep. But we still have to adjourn. Yes. Motion to adjourn the public meeting. Seconded. Are they frozen? They're not frozen for me, but Meredith is yeah. muted. Alrighty. Okay, we made yeah. the motion. We made the motion to adjourn. We just need a second now. Second. Okay. Second. Okay. Great. Okay, and uh, we're going to accept unanimous consent uh, for that um, uh, motion. So we'll see you all in a couple minutes.